Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broader reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Centre for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Project Support Officer at the Centre for Japanese Studies and Researcher of Japanese War Heritage. This week we are joined by Dr. Michael Tsang, Researcher Associate at Newcastle University. He will be discussing the impact of acclaimed author Haruki Murakami's Always on the Side of the Egg speech on the Hong Kong protests. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, Michael. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Good morning, and thank you for having me. So first of all, we'd like to know a little more about you. Uh, can you tell us about your field and how your interests brought you there? Sure. So I have a very complicated and mixed background. I did uh, my uh, undergraduate training in English, um, but then I did a minor in, in Japanese, and then I did uh, my master's in gender studies, working on the uh, novels of the Japanese author Murakami Haruki, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and then my uh, doctorate uh, went back to English, but I worked on Hong Kong literature. So I guess I'm always, I always have this sort of, of Asian, pan-Asian background, if you like, you know, looking at both um, Japan, Japanese culture, Japanese language, but also um, Hong Kong, uh, Chinese culture, Chinese language in, in, in the broader sense. Um, so yeah, I, th- I suppose East Asian, you know, literatures, East Asian cultures would be my, my field. Yeah, and so that the sort of informed kind of research that I do, including Murakami um, and his influence in, uh, in the Hong Kong protests. Well, let's get to the meats of the discussion then. In 2009, acclaimed author Murakami Haruki gave an acceptance speech at the Jerusalem Prize for the Freedom of the Individual and Society in Israel. In the context of this, he used his speech to explain a philosophy of his novel writing, between a high solid wall and an egg that breaks against it, I will always stand on the side of the egg. Could you give a brief breakdown of Murakami's speech and what it tells us about Murakami, his works and his politics? Sure. So there's a bit of background to Murakami's speech uh, before he gave this uh, message about the wall and, and, the, and the egg. And um, the Jerusalem Prize is um, a prize that is given out um, in Jerusalem uh, at the Jerusalem Book Fair um, every two years. And the Book Fair itself is supported by the uh, Foreign Ministry of, of Israel. So there is a bit of, of government background um, to it. Um, and so in, in the past, we've seen many laureates of the Jerusalem Prize being criticized for um, deciding to accept the prize. Um, and Murakami is uh, no exception. And so when he said in 2009 that he was going to um, accept the prize, um, there were some voices in, in, in Japan that criticized him for, for doing so. Um, and one of the most vocal groups is, um, is, is an organization in Japan that's called the Palestine, uh, the Palestine Forum Japan, I think. And this group uh, made an open letter to, uh, to Murakami Haruki asking him to reconsider his, his decisions, to think about kind of message that that would send to, to people from, uh, um, in, in, in Palestine and the kind of, of uh, potential support that he might be showing towards um, uh, the, the, uh, the Israeli government um, and the conflict. So... And that was the background to, to, uh, to the whole controversy. And Murakami, in his speech, said explicitly that he's aware of these criticisms, um, but he has decided nonetheless to come um, and see with his own eyes what the situation um, is like and to talk to people with his acceptance speech um, about you know, what, 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 what he thinks about it. So that was in this background that he gave the speech. Um, and so... Um, in the speech, he made the U-turn and then said, actually, today I'm not going to give a very direct political message. And instead, I want to share with you this philosophy of his novel writing. And that's the quote that you just read um, just now, Ollie. That between a high solid wall and an egg that breaks against it, um, I will always stand on the side of the egg. Now, that, he says, is the philosophy of his novel writing. Um, but then we can detect a little bit of a, of a, uh, of a political leaning here um, that he's trying to say that he will always stand on the side of the egg. So stand on the side of the people um, who protest, who resist against you know, the, the, the solid wall. And in fact, he then goes on to use um, some other 
metaphors to 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 describe what he's saying. Um, and he says the wall, the high solid wall that he talks about, could be um, could be compared to what he calls the system. You know, the system. Um, and and he then interprets the system as something like uh, you know wars, weapons, state apparatus. Um, and all sorts of sort of uh, oppression that that uh, a system could have on the individual. Now, the egg obviously are the the people, the individuals that fight against it, that resist against it. Um, and then Murakami also go on went on to say that um, no matter how right the war is and um, how wrong the eggs may be, he would still stand on the side of the egg. And that's a very important um, um, addition, I suppose you can say, addition to um, his original message that he said, no matter how right the wall is, so no matter how right the system may be um, and how wrong the people may be, he would still choose to stand on the side of the egg. Um, and I guess that sort of uh, concludes uh, you know, his, his novel writing philosophy. And if you look at many of his novels, um, he indeed, a lot of his novels focus a lot on the individual um, and how they uh, deal with, how they live in the very alienated world that, they, that they're living in, um, in, in the novels. Um, so I guess you could say that, you know, that very much reflects, you know, his, his, his novels um, and his characters and their stories um, as well. But at the same time, um, what I would say here is that even though Murakami says he's not giving a direct political message, and I'm quoting verbatim from, from, from his speech, direct political message, even though he's not doing that, um, I do think that he is suggesting um, you know, a, a different kind or a different understanding of politics um, and something that's very central to him. Um, and, and so if you, if you think about you know, the system as you know, uh, a national or, or state apparatus that, that oppress the people, um, that censor people's uh, uh, expression, for example, um, then he would be standing on definitely on the side of the people, those who fight against it. Um, and, and I suppose you can't really say that it's not politics because that very much has to do with you know, um, power struggles, uh, um, power relations uh, and all that. And so for me, that's still you know, a kind of politics. It's just not the kind of you know, big politics that, that, we, um, that we usually uh, focus on when we uh, talk about the word politics. You know, we might be thinking about um, transnational, transcontinental uh, you know, political struggles, um, diplomacy issues, that's the kind of politics or the image of politics that we have. Um, but for me, it seems to me that Murakami is talking about a different kind of politics, but politics nonetheless. Look, that's a caveat that you mentioned where you said no matter how uh, right the wall might be and how wrong the egg might be, that's a rather clever way of sort of making what could have been perceived as a very strong political statement to rather ambiguous statements, wouldn't you say? Um, I, I think so. And, and I think this is why Murakami is so good at this, that he's able, that he's able to turn a, a very sticky situation, you know, the controversy surrounding the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, and the criticism that, that, he, uh, that he received. He, he was able to change this uh, or to transform the sticky, sticky situation into something that uh, in, into something that uh, that is phrased very vaguely to the extent that he seemingly is able to transcend, you know, the kind of uh, real political conflicts that 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 he um, that he found himself into. And so, I, I guess um, you know, it, this is this is what Murakami does so well as as a novelist, as as a writer, right? Because he he his job basically is to deal with words and he's able to, to you know, phrase words in such a way that would um, get him out of these very situations with the very, you know, um, ambiguous, obviously, um, uh, metaphors that he's saying, you know, the wall, the egg, the system and all that. Um, but at the same time, it's precisely because, you know, it's very ambivalent that I think there is a lot of potential in, in there. Um, and it kind of shows how, you know, Murakami is able to use um, his craft, you know, with, with words um, and, and, you know, to, to get out of, you know, this one. So you've discussed this in a chapter that was published recently entitled Appropriating Murakami Haruki's Always on the Side of the Egg Speech in Hong Kong. And you recently wrote a blog post for Hong Kong Studies Association to give an update on the situation. Before we link Murakami to Hong Kong, 
Could you explain to us the context of the Hong Kong protests, which have been ongoing since 2014 and have recently flared up again in 2019? Sure. Um, even though you know the question says 2014, 2019, Hong Kong actually has had not necessarily a very long history of protests, but the whole string of protests um, actually didn't really start from, from 2014. It probably started from 2003, um, when China was trying to um, impose a law in Hong Kong um, that uh, uh, would uh, ban uh, treason, uh, you know, to, to, to the Chinese uh, nation. Um, and, and at that time, you know, the Hong Kong people protested um, and they went and they took to the streets. Um, they went on to, to, to the streets um, and there were, I think, half a million people joining the protest that year um, in 2003. And that was one of the largest protests that we've seen in, in, in recent um, Hong Kong history. Hong Kong, I suppose, uh, you know, for those, for the, for the audience here listening to podcasts right now, um, you might have a, an, an image of Hong Kong being, you know, this very well-developed, uh, you know, international city with lots of um, you know, skyscrapers and all that. And so indeed, that was the impression that, that Hong Kong has given to the world, that you know, people there were very much focused on you know, economic advancement, economic development, but not so much on, you know, the, on the politics. And that was the impression you know, about, about Hong Kong before 2003. But with 2003 and the protests there, um, you know, Hong Kong people seem to have sort of had an, had an awakening, a political awakening and, and protests um, have been uh, very uh, common ever since 2003. And then um, fast forward to um, 2014, um, in, in August uh, 2014, uh, the, uh, the National Congress in, in China um, released a document that would um, deny uh, the Hong Kong people um, of the right to uh, basically referendum right uh, uh, to, to vote um, in for their uh, mayor, uh, what we call the chief executive of, of Hong Kong, um, and also the parliament, um, what we call the legislative council um, of Hong Kong. Um, so with that ban on the voting rights of Hong Kong people, again, Hong Kong people choked to the streets um, and it sort of went into um, um, uh, an Occupy movement, uh, obviously referencing, you know, the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, in, in, in New York. Uh, 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 but uh, basically the Hong Kong protesters had a, a 79 day protest um, and Occupy movement in the central business district of Hong Kong. Um, um, between September um, and, and December that year. So that was the background to the 2014 protests. And then uh, more recently in, in, in 2019, um, China was trying to um, uh, start a new law in Hong Kong um, that, would, uh, that has something to do with uh, national security. So it's the national security law that they're trying to establish um, in Hong Kong. And again, there were a lot of concerns about, you know, the safety of Hong Kong people, um, the extradition um, arrangements, you know, where uh, people from Hong Kong would be sent back to China for, for trial. Um, but, but obviously, you know, if, if the, the fear is that, you know, if you say anything wrong, um, or anything not in China's favor, they could then see you as a criminal and then they could catch you and then they could you know, send you back to, to China. That was the fear with, with the whole uh, national uh, security law recently in 2019. And so again, you know, Hong Kong protesters took to the streets, um, this time with a lot more uh, uh, radical uh, actions, um, I would say. Um, and so that really was the background to, to the two uh, protests that I address in, in, in my work. I think it's important for those uh, who are not familiar with the legal status of Hong Kong to uh, clarify that it was returned to China by Britain um, in 1997, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So yeah. Hong Kong um, was the British colony uh, uh, for about 150 years um, under, uh, uh, under the United Kingdom and the British Empire. Um, and then in 1997, it was handed over back to uh, China. Um, so politically, Hong Kong is, is, is part of China. Um, but but it, it doesn't mean that you know there are no conflicts or, or different opinions between you know Hong Kong um, and China. It's uh, the issue of the one nation two systems. Oh, as what we call the one country two systems. That's yeah, it. so one country as in as in China, but two systems in in the sense that you know China has been practicing its socialist systems, um, and and Hong Kong technically quote unquote has been doing uh, the, the the capitalist system. Um, and, and China uh, made a promise, uh, uh, in fact, in 1984, in a, in a joint declaration uh, that they made with Britain uh, that they're going to keep uh, the capitalist system um, in Hong Kong 
um, unchanged for 50 years from 1997 to 2047, you know, for a period of 50 years, there should be no change. But uh, from, from, I suppose, from the Hong Kong people's perspective, you know, things have been changing, um, even though, you know, despite the promise, really. So would, you, would it be too oversimplifying to say that uh, the underlying issue behind these protests is uh, the central Chinese system infringing upon liberties which are meant to be protected in Hong Kong until 2047? I would say this is what the Hong Kong people perceive uh, their situation to be. So for, for, for a lot of Hong Kong people, I think what they feel is precisely that, you know, despite the promise um, of, you know, of, of, of a period of unchanged for 15 years, you know, we have been seeing an infringements of, of voting rights, for example, um, um, et cetera, um, and, and various liberties and freedoms, like you said, um, you know, and, and we are not even... 2047 yet, um, but these changes have already been been taking place, um, and I, can, I I think that's what uh, the Hong Kong people uh, were concerned about. So to take it back to Murakami, mm-hmm. uh, his speech came five years before the Hong Kong protests in 2014 began. Uh, firstly, what was the reception of his speech globally in the immediate aftermath, and secondly, how has his speech resurfaced in Hong Kong? Uh, so I think. I mean, like I said, uh, so Murakami made the speech um, at Jerusalem um, and partly in response to the kind of uh, criticisms that he had uh, with accepting the, 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 the prize. Um, but I think in the um, immediate aftermath of his speech, I guess uh, the, the controversy sort of died down um, and people seem to have received his speech pretty well. I mean, the whole... Uh, metaphor of the egg and and the wall, you know, it's it's a bit romantic, you know, it's 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 something, but it's also very visual, right? You can totally visualize, uh, you know, the the image of uh, uh, eggs um, sacrificing themselves, smashing themselves against, you know, a high solid wall. So it's a very visual metaphor, and it's very effective in that. Um, and so I guess I, I guess as as we as we have said, I think Murakami is very skillful in the speech. Um, in sort of uh, uh, um, directing the whole uh, controversy away uh, from the, the sticky political situation um, in Israel and in Palestine. Um, and so I think um, in, in the immediate aftermath, I think people reacted to his speech uh, very well. Um, but I think more broadly speaking, I think that's the kind of, because, because the whole metaphor with the egg and the war um, sort of touched upon, right, the, the whole idea of political protest, uh, political resistance. So I think that sort of gave people um, a chance to relate to it whenever people from other contexts in the world were uh, protesting against their own government. And this is, you know, what, 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 what happened um, in, in Hong Kong. So um, in, in 2014, and, be, and in fact, even a little bit before 2014, um, like I said, you know, the whole protest, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a continuum. Um, it has started from 2003, and there's never really uh, uh, stopped, really. Um, so there, there were already, you know, discussions of Murakami's uh, metaphor and speech even before 2014. Um, but but as, as people, Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong protesters were really uh, trying to cling on to Murakami's speech and the metaphor of the war and the egg. Um, to, to give them some sort of, you know, spiritual guidance, you know, so they appropriated the, the speech and the metaphor, um, and they imagined themselves, the protesters, they imagined themselves to be the egg that were breaking uh, uh, themselves against the, uh, the high wall, you know, the wall, uh, the system, the, the governments of Hong Kong and, and, and China in that sense. Um, and, and I guess that's how they were trying to uh, uh, reimagine themselves. Um, and at the same time, you know, those who defended China, those who stood on China's side, um, um, they also sort of criticized, you know, speech um, and, and, and the whole uh, war versus egg metaphor as well. So for a time, and in my chapter, um, I sort of identified some of these discourses that were going on in Hong Kong at the time um, and tried to uh, explain what's going on and, and how both sides of the, of the you know, Hong Kong-China conflict, how both sides were trying to appropriate, were trying to discuss um, uh, Murakami's speech um, and, and metaphor to uh, their benefit, really. Um, and then in 2015, you know, a little bit after the 2014 protests, um, one of uh, Murakami's fans from Hong Kong, um, a, a, a young girl, she actually wrote to Murakami Haruki, uh, 
Murakami at that time in 2015 was doing this, this column um, um, in, in a newspaper. He's trying to be this agony uncle, you know, answering uh, readers' questions. Um, and, 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 uh, and the Hong Kong reader actually wrote to, uh, to Murakami Haruki um, talking about you know, the kind of, of uh, the sense of defeat that they felt after the 2014 protests um, in, in Hong Kong didn't really you know, manage to, to gain much. Um, 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 and, and, and Murakami actually replied to, to, to that letter um, and, he, and he said that uh, 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 please don't give up um, the kind of things, the protests that you're doing um, will, will one day pay off. Uh, and so he actually took the time to reply to this, this, uh, this, this girl from Hong Kong. Um, and that again, you know, gave a huge boost of confidence to the protesters um, um, in Hong Kong. So that's the context of how his um, speech sort of resurfaced in Hong Kong, both by uh, the discussion that the people in Hong Kong are trying to have regarding his, his metaphor, the war and the egg, but also uh, uh, by virtue of the fact that he actually replied to this uh, fan letter um, in, in 2015. Um, and then uh, recently in the 2019 protests as well, um, once again, you know, the whole idea of the wall versus the A um, came up once again, you know, in, in public discourse. Uh, protesters, again, are trying to remind themselves of this whole A versus wall thing. Um, again, they, they, were, they were seeing themselves as the eggs. Um, so I, I would say that it, it, to a very large extent, I think Murakami's uh, uh, speech uh, and, the, and the metaphor, the war versus the egg metaphor, had a huge political impact um, to, to the Hong Kong protesters. Again, it's not something that is overtly political, but I would say that you know, it definitely has political impact to you know, protest, the protesters um, in, in Hong Kong. Would you say that this metaphor of the wall and the egg risks oversimplifying these complex political disputes? And how would you understand the relationship between literature and politics? Um, I agree only to the extent that I think a metaphor and, you know, Murakami is a novelist. So we're talking about a literary metaphor here, right? The war and the egg is a very literary metaphor. I would say that, you know, metaphors by nature um, tend to oversimplify things anyway, because, because metaphor is basically using one thing, a different thing, but normally that you can compare to, to the original thing, but you're using that as, as comparison. And so in the process of comparing the original thing with the metaphor, it always risks, you know, the, the oversimplifying things or some things are being always being lost because there are no one-to-one -one direct, you know, uh, correspondence between two different things anyway, right? So, you know, and, and uh, the egg, for example, um, Murakami is saying, oh, you know, the egg are the individuals, but, you know, there are different kinds of individuals in the world. Can we then say, oh, you know, all eggs are the same? Not really, right? So, so I think in that sense, you know, the, the, the metaphor of the egg um, as a way to compare to individual human beings it's it's already you know oversimplifying you know the the variety and the spectrum and the differences of you know all, all everyone on earth so it, it it has that sort of you know simplifying uh, danger but i would say that that's more that's what you know that's what the literary metaphor does but for me what is more important here in the process is that he uses something that's very visual um and very easy to understand right the whole image of, you know, egg smashing against the wall. Um, that's a very easy to understand image. And he's trying to use something that is so easy to understand, so accessible to people around the world. Um, and he sort of embeds um, uh, not a direct political message, but a, a hidden, um, a, a covert political message um, in or behind that metaphor. And I think it's, 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 it's in this hidden aspect that gives the whole speech and the metaphor a, a huge potential for people around the world, including people from, from Hong Kong, um, to appropriate them, to evoke on them, to draw on, on these metaphors, um, and to become a sort of a spiritual sort of uh, a support um, for the protests that, 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 that they've been doing. So I guess, I guess, in, in, I, I guess, what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that 
you know, the relationship between literature and politics is, is very complex. Um, but ultimately, literature is literature and politics is politics. And what this means is that, you know, you, you cannot really explain literature entirely in terms of politics, but you cannot really entirely explain politics in terms of literature either. So when Murakami is trying to use this literary metaphor, the war and the egg, it definitely risks you know, uh, erasing some of the real political disputes and conflicts that are happening, you know, on, on, on our planet every single second. There is the, there's danger of that. But then on the other hand, you know, certain political conflicts cannot really contain the, the, the political, uh, the, the metaphor that Murakami is, is using either. And so, you know, with the metaphor that he's using, the war and the egg, uh, other people from other contexts in, in the world, from you know, protesters from Hong Kong, for example, they will be able to draw strength and inspiration from that metaphor. Um, whereas, you know, they may not see so much uh, 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 from, you know, from, from the Israeli-Palestine conflict um, directly, but they were able to draw sources of strength and inspiration from, you know, Murakami's metaphor of the war and the egg. And I guess this is where, you know, the, the potential and the power of literature really lies. Would you say that this example shows the sort of agency that a world-famous novelist can have in these kind of political disputes? I would definitely uh, say so. And the interesting thing about Murakami is that Murakami is often seen to uh, have uh, several phases of his career. And the first phase of his career, going all the way up to, say, 1995, you know, he started publishing uh, novels in 1979. Um, but the first phase of his, uh, of his career, uh, people tend to say that his novels were a little bit apolitical um, or apathetic um, to, to, to politics. Um, although there is a lot of discussion there, you know, a lot of debates there um, as well. But he didn't really, Murakami didn't really, uh, you know, write his, his, um, his novels against a particular political incident, you know. Um, but that sort of changed or it was per perceived or people perceived that, you know, Murakami had a change um, um, around 1995 when the sarin gas uh, attack happened in the Tokyo Metro in, in 1995. Um, and, and Murakami himself was very shocked, and he did um, several works um, um, interviewing um, the, the attackers as well as the victims and the families of the victims. Um, um, and he published these interviews later on um, in, in the form of nonfiction. So it seems that uh, people could identify sort of a, a political change um, in Murakami's own novels um, um, around the time of you know, 1995, 1997. Um, and so Murakami is, has this really interesting reputation of being from, um, from an apolitical, quote-unquote, apolitical writer to uh, you know, a, a politically engaged writer. And so nowadays, with 2009, the, you know, the, the Jerusalem Prize acceptance speech, as well as uh, you know, several acceptance speeches that, that he has since given um, after the Jerusalem Prize, um, he has been using you know, his, the, these speeches um, as, uh, as a very interesting channel or avenue um, to voice his, his uh, slightly more political, uh, you know, stance. Um, the, the kind of politics that, that I'm talking about here, again, has less to do with, you know, real uh, political conflicts, uh, you know, in, on a transnational scale or on a diplomatic scale. I'm not talking about that kind of politics. But it's a kind of politics that deals with, you know, power relations, power struggles, um, you know, on the individual level between two individuals, for example, between two groups of individuals, for example. Um, so so it's, it's a lot more microscopic than that. And I think that's where his, his politics uh, or his he's interested, uh, you know, in, in that sort of politics um, a little bit more. Um, but I would definitely say that, you know, he has been using some of his acceptance speeches as a very interesting avenue or outlet um, of, of his own brand of politics. Um, and, and in fact, I do, if, if there is a chance, you know, in, in, in future, I do hope to do a little bit more work on, on, on this, on the genre of, of speech um, and speech making um, and how that sort of related to uh, Murakami's own understanding um, of politics, um, you know, in, in general. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's been a wonderful uh, episode.
thank you for having me. Um, and and I hope I've managed to uh, shed light on on Murakami Haruki um, and also you know his his own brand of politics, which I understand is not what we usually understand politics to be. But I think nonetheless, to me, it is still a, a, a kind of politics. You can find Michael's research profile in the description below. You can read more about his research in his chapter entitled Appropriating Murakami Haruki's Always on the Side of the Egg Speech in Hong Kong in Modern Japanese Political Thought and International Relations. Join us next week when we will be in discussion with Warren Stanislaus, PhD candidate at Oxford and Associate Lecturer of Global and Transnational Intellectual History at Rikyo University on the Black Lives Matter movement and Afro-Japanese Cultural Exchange. Thank you for listening.